Sunday after Easter, how's it working for you? Yeah, you know, what, what is that about, right? You know, it's always a different, uh, a different time. And uh, here's the one thing I noticed about this. It's so funny about the kind of job that have this kind of Your brothers and Ace, he knows all the Easter candy. He's put right when you walk in the door, right? It's discounted. And then Mother's Day cards are out now. You know, you see that? You can see that. And then also, at the church, you know, it's easier to park now, right? <laughs> you know, notice that the park is kind of easy to do, right? And, and did you notice the dress code now? It's more relaxed, right? <laughs> now, to be sure, my dress is, uh, you know. Also, uh, in, in church life, uh, I've noticed, you know, now we don't sing Up From the Grave Your Rose. That's a hard song to sing. We don't sing that one anymore. Cause I, we didn't do it this year. It's too hard for us. But uh, some other things are, a lot of pastors take the Sunday off after Easter. It's a good time to take a break. You know why? Low attendance. <laughs> y'all just show up just because y'all don't know any better. You know? So, <laughs> y'all don't know on church because it's Sunday, you know. But, but normally that's the norm. You take, you take that Sunday off. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. I, I know I'll probably need this for them in there. So I mean, if you can keep working on that. Otherwise, I can talk about uh, I have eight kids, so I'm used to yelling. Right? <laughs> Can you hear me? What? Can you hear me? <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, so usually the Sunday after Easter is, is always this, this kind of strange Sunday. And, and uh, what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to continue that story that I finished on. Who were here Easter? Yeah. Did you have a good time? They said, well, I got it. Man, just... Uh, the Lord just seemed to bless that and their preach on this. And so I didn't get quite finished because, you know, you guys have ham in the ovens and the bunnies are melting outside. And, and all, I know the activity that goes on there, you know, being a father. And, and, and so I, I cut it a little short. But I want to finish the story. May, may I do that this morning? Yes. All right, may I finish that story. So uh, if you have your Bibles, you're going to turn to Luke chapter 24. And there's not a lot of notes up there, but... Uh, uh, I kind of told the story of last week. Uh, I want to revisit that story and, and tell it again. Thank you for those of you who sent me emails, a long email, some of you. And uh, thank you for those emails and, and comments about last Sunday. I appreciate it. What happens when we see Jesus? I mean, really, what's the, that's really what the story is all about. The Sunday, the first Easter Sunday is. What happens is when we see Jesus? When we see Jesus, does he really make a difference in our lives? And can we really see him and embrace him even today? We read the story on the other side of resurrection and the ascension and the promises of Acts. And we see all the promises that we know that the Lord is with us through his Holy Spirit. We have all these promises, but I want to go back and visit this because sometimes I think we as disciples of Jesus are still stuck in those locked doors. And, and what my, my purpose is this morning is, I, I want us to revisit this story and see the outcome of these two individuals that saw Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Are you with me? Okay, let's pray before we do this. Lord, we thank you for this unbelievable, incredible story. And Father, we're humbled by this, and may we really see this in a different light. And though maybe we've read this many times, Father, open our eyes today. We can really see you in this. And what does that mean to us today? Father, you know my prayer earlier this morning that lives will be changed in this place, that it's just not a thing that we happened into, but it's a thing that is happening in us. For that, we're grateful. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Some of you are praying for brevity. Don't worry about that. That's not going to happen. Okay. What happens after we see Jesus? Hey, Joe, we're, we're going to forego reading the scripture. We're going to read it later. So let's, let's go to that first point there. So what happens when we see Jesus? Last Sunday we talked about this. The first Easter, the first, the first Easter, the day of resurrection, we see two men that, will, that are disciples of Jesus. What's his name? We know one name. His name is Cleo, right? Cleopas. Cleo and his other companion. And we know that they have been with the disciples. They've heard the stories about the resurrection. And yet they've chosen to leave because they're disappointed. They're heartbroken. They, they, it's not what they expected. And because they're not, uh, you know, this, 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 
movement and motions of disappointment has caused them just to walk away from the promises of God. And so they're moving away from the promises of God. They're moving away from Jerusalem, which is the city of God, which is the, represents the presence of God. They're moving away from that because they're disappointed. They're, they're crushed. They're broken. You ever been there before? You just don't know what to do. You find yourself kind of slipping further and further away. Sometimes when you get depressed or disappointed, you know, you, you don't want to go to church, you know, because the people there, they're happy. You don't want to be around happy people, right? Or, or people that's going to encourage you because you like that journey of, of walking away from. Because it, there's a sense of, I'm going to go to a place where, I'm, where, where it's home, where it's more secure, and that's where they're going. They're going to Emmaus. And so they're on this journey. They're disappointed. They're heartbroken. They're confused. They don't understand what's going on. And I need to plug this in a little and, and so they're walking away. There's nothing left. And what, is, what happens in the story that we looked about last Sunday is that Jesus comes to them that are walking away. Isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> Even though they're walking away from the promises of God, they're walking away from what God, what Jesus told them to do. That he said, stay in Jerusalem because I'm going to show up there later. Be faithful to me. And they're walking away from that. But Jesus shows up to them even though they're walking away. I want you to touch your neighbor and say, even though you're walking away, you're walking away. I'll just stop if I do this. <laughs> even though we're walking away, guess what? Tell your neighbor, he's coming after you. <laughs> and so in this, in this, when Jesus shows up, they're walking away. He says, hey guys, what are y'all talking about? I like that. We, we talked about I don't want to rehearse that too much, but what are you guys talking about? He didn't get him in the headlines. Where are y'all going? Get back in there. You know, they didn't do, he didn't do that. He just, what are y'all talking about? And they look at him and say, don't you know? Where have you been? <laughs> That's kind of funny to me. Where have you been? And, and, and then they begin to tell him. And then Jesus has this conversation with them. I want you to see this because we're going to be looking at this story and he reverses this. He does the same thing that he does with these men. He goes to their home. He eats with them. He has a conversation about who he is. He shows himself to him. The same thing happens is just when they get to back to Jerusalem. And so he has this conversation with them and they go home and they have a meal. And the Bible says that their eyes were open. They see Jesus. Amen? Amen. So what happens then? They see Jesus. That's a happy ending, right? That could have been a period mark right there and just said, well, they see Jesus and they're happy and their lives are changed and put a period there and there's a happy ending. How many of y'all like happy endings? How many of y'all watch the Hallmark Channel? You know, isn't that, isn't that amazing, the Hallmark Channel? Yeah. And, and the stories are, you know, there's, there's a relationship and then there's broken relationship and there's problems and there's, there's more problems and they don't know how to do the problems and they resolve the problems and there's a what? A happy ending. Everybody loves a happy ending. It reminds me of a little boy that went to, the, went to, to a place to buy a dog. He finally is going to get his first dog and, and dad says, you can pick out any dog that you want to pick out. And he's looking at them and, you know, all those puppies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't y'all love puppies? We raise golden retrievers and they're, they're happy dogs. They're the dogs that are on the Perina dog chow picture because golden retrievers are happy dogs, you know. They have that personality like your preacher does, you know, golden retriever. <laughs> he's just happy to be here, happy to be here, happy to be here, you know. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and so he picked out this dog and, and his dad said, why did you pick out that dog? He said, Dad, did you see his tail wiggling? He said, he just wiggle, wiggle. He says, Dad, I love happy endings. <laughs> anyway, so that was, my, that was my Easter joke. I didn't get to tell y'all that. So. so now what? So they see Jesus. So now what? We see the rest of the story. I'm going to give you three points. First of all, we're going to see, after they see Jesus, here's what happens. There's a change of heart. There's doors of opportunities, and the, then they see, they see the presence and the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. You in? Okay, number one, a change of heart. We're going to look at verses 31 through 32. A change of heart, we see from broken hearts to burning hearts. And I mentioned a little bit about this, but I want to go back and visit that just a little bit more. Understand who these men are. They're broken heart. They're disappointed. 
they had they had this idea of who the Messiah was going to be, and it didn't work out the way that they wanted to. Anybody can identify that? Sometimes in life, things don't work out that the way that you thought they were. Even perhaps you might have heard from God and directed by God, and you move toward that, and it still doesn't work out the way that you thought it was going to work out. How do you respond? And that's where the disciples are. They're broken, and yet their eyes are open when they see Jesus. I love this part. That while they're, let me read that to you. And then we'll, I'll respond to that. And their eyes were opened. After what? Jesus broke the bread. Do you remember that? I told, I told you that last night. When he broke the bread, their eyes were open. And I told you about three or four ways that that might have come about. It doesn't matter. But their eyes are open. They finally realize who they've been talking to on this road to Emmaus. And their eyes were open. Say that with me. Their eyes were open. That is so important. They see Jesus. Their eyes were open. And they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. A little different on the second story that we're going to look about. And then they said, Cleo and his companion, and they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn with us while he talked to us on the road? And while he opened to us what? Scriptures. And so in this conversation, we have to go back to verse 27. And what in verse 27 said that he was talking to him, talking to them about scriptures concerning himself. He's revealing himself in this conversation. And all of a sudden, as, as he's talking about the scriptures and, and they're confused and they're, and they're disappointed and, and they don't know what's going on, the despondency, they're moving away. Jesus meets them when they're, where they're at. I love what Hebrews says, so great a salvation is Jesus. Isn't that amen? He meets us right where we're at and it says while they're on the road. I like that because he meets us where we're at, Right. Even though we're moving away from him, he meets us where we're at. So on the road, because the Bible says that he is the whole dose. He is the way, the truth, and the light. He is that way. He is that door. And so I like this part also that he was explaining to them in Scripture in verse 27, the things that were concerning him. So, so oftentimes when we have problems in our life, we react to the circumstances and the situations, right? And so often when we do that... We, we sometimes miss the perception of his presence and also even the, the, the compensation and the comprehension of who he really is. Because why? We're focusing in on our problems and sometimes we miss the bigger picture. Have you seen the, the, the new art that's kind of, it's been out there for a while. And what they do, they take many different uh, pictures of things and they, they place them together to form a big, bigger object. You can say, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know what that art, y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about? What? Gazunta. What now? A collage? Maybe so. I don't know what that is. But anyway, a lot of different pictures, and it's a modern art. And what happens is if you focus in on all those little small images, you miss out on the bigger images. And that's what happens to us a lot of times, right? We get so, so focused in on all these things and distractions in our life that we miss the bigger picture. And that's exactly what happened to these two men as they're traveling down the road. There are folks that I'm just, we're just disappointed. We don't know what to do. We're going to go back home. I wonder, I wonder if our family's going to like us. We've been gone for a long time. We've been following Jesus. These are some disciples. They're not the 12, but they are disciples. They followed him. They were, they were a part of the disciples in the, in the room when they were locked up because the lady showed up. So they've seen all this, and they're just going back home. They're so confused and so disappointed in life. And they've been focusing on all these little things, even on the road while Jesus is talking with them. And they're missing the big picture. Our prayer is this, Lord, help us to look beyond the perception of the small to see what you're doing in our life, which is always much larger. Amen? And so when we see Jesus, here's what happens is, is that our eyes are open and, and something happens, burns within us. It wasn't so much that, that he caused that fire yet. He says later on, there will be the fire of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, we see the rest of the story here. But we also see that there's a change of heart, a heart of brokenness to a heart that is burning for him. I mean, a heart that's burning for him, Right. You remember when you first came to Jesus? I don't know if you're, you're like me, but just for an illustration point. You know, I, I, when I ca came to Jesus, I, it was just kind of a religious thing to do. You know, you, you come to him, and, and he really came into my heart, but there wasn't a huge amount of change. I knew I, I sensed a sense of, of emptiness that was a fulfillment. And I knew Jesus came into my life, 
But it was later on when, when I began just to wonder in life and, uh, you know, as much as a 15, 16 year old can do legally. Anyway, and so there was that, and it was moving away from him, but, but he came to me while I was moving away. This same story, it's my story. And, and while I was moving away from him, he came and spoke to me and said, son, what are you doing? It, it, and that changed my, my, my desire. I had Jesus, and I knew Jesus, like these men. They, they knew Jesus, they had Jesus, but it was drifting away. And something happened that caused them to have a heart that is burning for me. I, I, I love what Jeremiah says. He says, every time I mention the name of, of God, I get into trouble. And he did. I mean, he, he was just 24 hours out of being shackled in, in, in the square. And when you were shackled in the square in the Old Testament time, they would come and they would, they would spit on you and they would hit you. They would kick you in the face. They had total liberty to do whatever they wanted to. 24 hours, he was just locked up in the square and they, he was abused. And he comes back and he said, every time I mention your name, God, something bad happens to you. But it's, but, but it's like a fire burning deep within my bones and I must do that. And that's what it is when you see Jesus. And if you're here today and you just kind of lost that cutting edge, today I encourage you, look, look at who we're following. See him for who he is. He is the resurrected Son of God, the one who takes away all of man's sin, who was humbled and died on the cross for your benefit and for my benefit, to take away our sins, but also to empower us to live of that abundant life through him alone. Amen? That's the risen Jesus that we're serving. When we see him as he really is, our lives cannot be the same. That's the first thing. When we see Jesus, our hearts are changed. The second thing that we see is that they're doors of opportunity. When we see Jesus, there are doors of opportunity. Next deal, Joe. Show, show that one. From impossible locked doors to possible locked doors. Now re read that again because that's not a misprint. Because a lot of times you hear sermons like this, from the impossible locked doors to the possible unlocked doors. But that's not what we're looking at this morning. And I want to teach you something. Can, can y'all be teachable this morning? Okay. And so I want to teach you something here that's a little different than what probably most of us hear if you turn the flip on the television. That God unlocks all the doors for us and makes life easy, right? Yeah. Nah, doesn't work that way, does it? And it doesn't work that way on the road to Emmaus, okay? Let me read that scripture verse for us. 33 through 35. And they, who are they? Come on, y'all stay with me, ma'am. Y'all want to get out before noon? Okay. In California? Okay. And they rose that same hour. They're talking about Cleopas and his companion. What happened to them? They just saw Jesus. And then he disappeared. And they go, man, our hearts are burning. No wonder our hearts are burning. Man, we've, we've got to do something with this. Our hearts are burning. That's what burning hearts do. You've got to do something with it. You've got to release it, just like Jeremiah. You can't contain Jesus. When Jesus has all of you, you're uncontainable. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah. That's why we have religion. Okay, they rose that same hour and returned to where? Where were they coming from? Where was Jerusalem? It was a place of sorrow and pain and disappointment. Right? Do, do y'all understand the full circle? We, that was the title of the sermon yesterday. Or yesterday was Sunday. You know, the full circle, the return trip. That's, that's, that's the resurrection. And so here we are, the return trip. Here they go. They got, they're going back to where they just left. Pain, sorrow, disappointment, perhaps death. All right? They saw Jesus crucified. They knew the result. If they continued to follow him, they probably could be crucified like Christ. Anybody for that? Don't think so. Let's go the other way. The other way looks better than that way, right? They go back there. All right. If any man desires to come after me, what? He's got to go back to Jerusalem, right? You got to deny yourself, take up the what? That's his words. Okay. <laughs> and they found the 11. Who are the 11? Okay. All right. And those who are with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon. And then they told what happened to them on the road to Emmaus, and how he was known to them in the breaking 
of the bread. That's a pretty cool story right there. They go back and they're excited about that. There's a, there after, after, you know, the crucifying on, on that first Easter, the disciples, where are they at? They're locked away. John chapter, John chapter 20, verse 19, gives a little bit more indication where the disciples on that first Easter Sunday, he specifically says they were behind locked doors. John chapter 20, verse 19. And so they're behind locked doors. We don't see that in here, but we know that they're in Jerusalem, and we know these guys are with them because they just said, yeah, when they were talking to Jesus, yeah, the, we, we heard the, women's, the women said that there, there was a resurrection, but we don't believe that, and, and now we've left. And so now they're walking away, and yet now they're going back. Let me tell you this. Burning hearts doesn't mean the circumstances change. Can I say that one more time? Just because you have a burning heart, and you've seen Jesus, and now you know the resurrected Jesus, it doesn't mean circumstances are different. Because here's where they've been. They've been with the disciples. Now, now kind of go with this a minute. Let me tell this story a little bit. And so they've been with the disciples that first Easter morning. And the ladies have come back and they said, man, we've seen angels. We, we've heard that Jesus is alive. They've heard that same story. And they've hung out there, and finally they, they look at one another, Cleopas and his companion, and they said, what are we going to do now? They said, I, I don't, let's just go home. L let's just go home. I don't think anything's going to happen. And they leave the disciples, and where are the disciples? They're locked away in a room. So can you imagine when they leave, the disciples say, hey, y'all lock the door behind you, <laughs> you know? Because they're fearful. And so they know where to find the disciples. And they've heard that locked door. And they're going back. And so when they get there, now, now, now wait a minute. When God speaks to us, doesn't he unlock the doors and make it really easy for us? He doesn't. They go back to those locked doors again. They're pounding on the door, you know. You know. It's us. <laughs> They've got the doors locked. They're scared to death, right? They're still locked away. Do you, can, I, can I say that a little bit more? Sometimes we have this ideal, and I don't know where we get this from, that if we hear from God, and God commands us to go in a, in a direction, and we're being obedient to Him, that He's going to open all those doors up for us, and it's going to really be an easy way. It's going to make it very easy for us, because He's unlocked the doors, and we don't have to do any unlocking, right? Where do we get that from, Right? I mean, most of us in this room, we, we kind of say, well, I don't, I don't think it's of God because he just, that door's still locked. Now, I know, I know we, you know, we struggle with that, and I struggle with that. You know, how do you know God's will? Number one question, how do we know God's will? Well, if the doors are unlocked, that's God's will, right? Not necessarily. Because you can unlock doors yourself. Yeah? How many of you unlock the door and you go, I wish I hadn't done that. That didn't work out, right? Yeah, who let the dogs out? That's a great song. That is so secular. I don't know where you are. We're being so spiritual here. We have to edit that on YouTube. These things go on there. And so, who taught us that idea? So I really want you to get, hey, can y'all listen just for a second? I'm telling you, when we see Jesus, he's, he opens these doors, but sometimes those doors are still locked. We're talking about the doors of opportunities, whether they're locked or open. Amen? Are you with me so far? And so what we're talking about, he gives us these opportunities. And sometimes they seem so impossible, but he makes a way that is possible, but they still may be locked doors. Can I give you an illustration? Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Don't turn there. Mark chapter 2, it's a familiar story, is that all right? Oh, excuse me, you can turn there if you want to. Mark chapter 2 talks about this story. Y'all know the four men that uh, had, had uh, the, well, the paralytic had, a, had, a good, had four good friends. And that paralytic who, who could not walk, who was bedridden, don't know how long, how long he was, but he was bedridden for a long time. And he had four good friends, and they heard Jesus was in town. And the four friends, y'all know the story now? And the four friends... They said, we hear Jesus in town. Let's take him down there because we believe that he's going to be healed. And you know the story. It says there that when they got to the house where Jesus was, let me tell you a little bit about 
uh, in, in Jesus' day, the houses there, most of the houses were one big room. And some of them, uh, uh, archaeologists tell us, uh, even some of the rooms are big enough to hold 50, 60, maybe even 70 people. So it's a pretty good open, airy room. And the roofs there are not like the roofs here, made out of metal, but they're thatched roofs or, or mud roofs, so they're easy access. So these men, I think they were carpenters, they were construction guys, because they, they've got a plan here. So they get there, and the Bible says that, that there was a crowd there. And Jesus was teaching, and it was so crowded, the Bible says specifically, that even the doorway was unacceptable or unaccessible. And so they couldn't even get in because the door was what? Say locked. locked. Yeah, it was locked they, with people. They couldn't get in. And so the theology that we've bought into, if those men had bought into, would say, well, we tried. I guess it's not God's will that our friend is healed today, right? We can't get in. <laughs> and that had been the end of the story, right? Thank goodness for men and women that have faith. Faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. The evidence of what? Locked doors. That's it. And so I, I, I think these are good old boys. I think they're from West Texas, really, because they're good old boys. Uh, we just don't take no for an answer. And so Larry Joe and Stephen Allen and Bubba <laughs> and Gary Don, like, what are we going to do? Well, we can leave him here, and maybe Jesus will come out, or we can just haul him back. Or maybe there's another way. Sometimes when the door looks locked, I think we've got to get a different perspective, a higher perspective. How's that? We've got to look up, right? That's pretty good right there, right? You know, that'll, that'll preach right there. And so they go, I saw a set of stairs back there. Do you see those? Yeah. That's why I like they're construction guys. They saw the stairs. I built this house, you know, and yeah, I think there's some stairs. Let's, let's go to the roof. Let's go up there. Guys, I think sometimes when doors are shut, we've got, to, we've got to look at a different perspective here. And even though it's locked, and even though it looks like we can't get in, there are ways that we can handle this when we look at it at a higher level than what we're looking at. And sometimes all we can see is just, just you know, above water, you heard that expression, just above water, that's all we can see. We're just trying to tread water so we can make it through, and we miss those opportunities to walk higher. And I think so often we, it's so important that, that when we do this, we're able to see the full impact. Let me flip that next sentence before I go on, Joe. Life's biggest opportunities are not obvious and the most convenient. You agree with that? That's a tough one, isn't it? Life's biggest opportunities are not the obvious. Have you ever heard the expression, through the roof? <laughs> Prices are going what? Through the, what does that mean? It means that what, they're higher, right? Here's where we get that expression. So these four men, they go, we're going on the roof and we're going to dig through. But can you imagine that? I mean, sitting in that room, if you, there's, there's more than 50 of us, but let's say we're, we're all gathered here, and all of a sudden we hear something up there. What is that? You know? Brian, go check that out up there. I'm, not, I'm, I'm teaching here. Brian, go hear that. Do you hear that noise up there? What is that noise up there? And they're teaching. They're, they're you know, and they, all of a sudden you see dirt falling in. Can you imagine? That would have been a pretty cool story, right? And what the heck? And, and, and then all of a sudden you see some hands, and they're pulling this back. And then you, then you see this guy being dropped in, you know? I don't know how they dropped him. Maybe they just dropped him. I don't know, you know? I, but somehow he gets in. Maybe they had rope. I don't know the story. But, you know, they drop him in there. And then notice this. And then Jesus looks up. At, and and, and I, I think, in my, in my thoughts, that those guys must be looking down because he looks at them. He says, their faith. He looks at these, these four guys. He says, their faith. And then he looks at this guy, and he says, your sins are forgiven. It's kind of a strange deal. Understand Jewish mindset. Jewish mindset, a lot of times, physical illness and sin were kind of linked together a lot of times. And, and really, Jesus kind of 
you know, forgoes that and kind of debases that because he says, you know, with the blind man, he says, why is he blind? Well, he must have sin. He goes, no, no, it's not sin. It's for the glory of God. So, see, there's no connection there. But, but anyway, they had that mindset. And so he looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. And, and so you think, okay. But I'm, I'm thinking those four guys up there, because what they did, they, they saw this door of, that was crowded, this, this obstacle, this disappointment that they couldn't get their friend in. And rather than just staying at that door of disappointment, they said, let's go make another way. And they tear this open and then they drop down there and then they hear that Jesus is just forgiven his sin. That's not what they came for, right? Right? What did they come for? They came for healing. And I can imagine they said, wait, 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 did, he's, he's going he's gonna to forgive his sin. We brought him to be healed and he's doing that do y'all know sometimes jesus bypasses what we want to give us what we need yes. y'all know that and so sometimes we ask for things that we think we need but he gives us really what he want i'd rather have what 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 we what we need rather than what we want sometimes and so it does that and then what happens is in this conversation that some of the scribes were there and these guys were pretty critical of Jesus, and those, so they looked at them and said, "But who does?" And they're not saying it out loud. The Bible says they're thinking that in their heart, so they kind of perceive that, and that in their heart, and Jesus perceives that that they're they're making these comments in their heart, and they're saying, "Who does he think he is that he can forgive sin? That's blasphemy." And Jesus just calls them out on it. He says, "I know what y'all are thinking over there." And, and I did forgive his sins, but, but that's greater than just causing him to walk. But I'm going to do it anyway. And he's, he looks to this guy and he says, rise up and walk, you know. And sometimes our opposition sometimes is sometimes locked doors, right? You, you do understand that, that when you see Jesus and you begin to move toward the fullness of his grace and purpose and destiny, you've got to understand there's going to be opposition in your life. Do you know that? There's, there's always going to be that opposition. In other words, people aren't going to like you, and people aren't going to think you're just this wonderful person, and that, that, that what you say, and, and being obedient to God, that everybody's just going to go, oh, you're right. It just doesn't happen that way. You know that? And sometimes when opposition comes, what are you going to do? You see, when you see Jesus, there's going to be op opportunity. We just said that. There's going to be doors of opportunities, but you've got to understand there's going to also be doors of disappointment and doors of opposition. How are you going to handle that opposition? Do you know what I really think the, the neat thing about that story about the four guys? We can say the four guys are the heroes. We can say the healing. And Jesus is always the center of everything, by the way. But I think what we see is that opposition, how Jesus deals with that and that he makes a way, even in the midst of opposition. So some of us can rejoice. Some of you, you know, you have people in your life that just have rejected you and turned against you and have hurt you. Do you know that's still a door that the Lord can use in your life? Amen? God never was to hurt. And so he can use that in your life, that opposition and, and, and people that have rejected you and turned against you. And I think life's biggest opportunities are sometimes opposition. When we see Jesus, there's a change of heart, brokenness to burning. When we see Jesus, there are doors of opportunity and, and, and disappointment, opposition. And third of all, when we see Jesus, there's a present and power of the resurrected Jesus. From invisibility to invincibility. We see a change here. And this is the best part of the story I like in, in this. And we see kind of the end of here. It's a little confusing to us because we, we know that this is the first Easter morning. And then we see the ascension of Jesus at, toward the end and, and, the, and the foretelling of that. And there's a 40-day period there. We don't see that in here, but, but we know it's happening. And I'll, I'll explain that in just a, a few more minutes here. Now understand here, the disciples are locked away. Their initial response to the death of Jesus was, was just total devastation, unbelief and hiding. It's interesting to note that when Jesus showed up in his resurrected body, the number one thought and the number one process in those that he revealed himself through was unbelief and disbelief and also fear and isolation in all those. 
But when we see, when, when they see Jesus, we see uh, transformation, we see boldness and joy and worship, and we see this, this hiding, this being invisible, trying to, to, to not make waves, if you would, to becoming men and women that would turn the world upside down during, during these days. What, what happened here between these, these disciples and the women that were with them from, from hiding and being invisible and trying to not make any waves and, and not being noticed to, to becoming in Acts we see in chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and all in Acts, we see these great men and women that are just exploding with boldness and worship. What happened to them? It's pretty simple. They've seen Jesus. They've seen Jesus. And when you see Jesus as he really is, it makes a difference. You can't, you can't be the same. You think we need that today? I think so. To really see Jesus. And see, we're on the other side of the ascension. And we're on the other side of Acts chapter 2. We're on the other side of this. And yet the word is so clear that we're different. And the presence of God lives in us. And we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us, right? That empowers us. And sometimes I think we, we escape in these four walls called church. And that's our security, and that's our, that's our blanket, and we can, we can come here and encourage each other, because we know the world is going to be hard, and, and, and we, we encourage, and yet we're so fearful to go out in the world, and we feel good here. Sometimes I think we're not Acts chapter 2 church, but we're Mark chapter 24 church, and we hide fearfully, hoping nobody will notice we're Christians. And so now. So what happens when they see Jesus? Let me just kind of read this, kind of great story here. Kind of lengthy. Read this? Yeah. Today? You don't have that? Somebody have Mark chapter uh, 24, verse, what is it, 35? Where am I at here? That's what I said, Mark. What did I say, Luke? Right. Where's that? 36? Yeah, there it is. And so these guys show up, and where are they at? They're in, they're in the room where the disciples have locked themselves away. When they show up here, finally after pounding the door open, what I think, and they said Jesus himself, and after they told him these things, what I'm to him, notice what Jesus was there. I like that. See, Jesus is always behind locked doors anyway. Y'all know that? So we think he's not there. When he th we think he's out there. We're not sure. He's always behind locked doors. And Jesus said, and, and Jesus stood among them and said, "Then peace be unto you." And, and by the way, that was that, I think that was more than a greeting. I know that was a common, you know, shalom and all that. But but it was more than that. I think he, he saw their disappointment. He saw their isolation. He saw the locked door, right? Their fear. And he speaks to them this peace. It's, it's more than just a, hello, how are you, which was a common term. I think it was more of my peace, is what I believe. But they were what? Startled and frightened. And they thought they saw a spirit. Some of your translations may say what? Ghost. It's amazing they believe in ghosts and that they struggle with the resurrected Jesus. Isn't that interesting there? And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt arises in your heart? I love this comment. Jesus comes right where we're at. And it may be a little, but, but what he's doing, he's identifying where they're at in the source of why the doors are locked. He says, why are y'all doing that? See my hands, and notice where he moves right into the physical. See my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. Touch me and see him for my spirit. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones. He knew that they were, thought he was a ghost. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelief for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? <laughs> I like that. That's what he did earlier with Cleopas and the companion. He said, Let's eat. And he broke some bread. And he does the same thing again. And we see this when he met the disciples when they were fishing. He said, let's eat. Ah, I just love that part, you know. He says, it's me. 
And y'all know me, I like to eat. And so he says, let's eat again. Uh, I, just, I just think that's really cool. Y'all may not, but y'all get over it. And so, and they gave a piece of broiled fish and he took and ate it before them. The first thing that I, it's just real, real quick here. I just want to say three things concerning this. First of all, the physical evidence is here. I think what Jesus does right here, he shows them the physical evidence. He says, look, it's me, guys. You know me. You've seen me. You've been with me. It's me. He identifies them at their level of their lack of faith. And he says, you've got to have a breakthrough on this, and it's me. It's the physical evidence. And, and this unbelief, the number one problem that I said earlier was the, the, the believing of, of resurrection was that they were troubled in their spirit. And they, the reason that they were troubled in their spirit was because they felt like they had been abandoned, that Jesus was no longer there. Do y'all see kind of a connection here? And here's the connection, that the peace of God is closely related to the presence of God. The peace of God is closely related to the presence of God. Every one of us has a story in this room. I guarantee you that. A time of disappointment, of, of maybe just you have no idea what you're going to do. Maybe that you've lost a loved one. And you sense the, the, the loneliness or maybe the isolation or whatever. Maybe a long period of life, maybe a short period of time. But I promise you this. It's when you sense the presence of God in your life, you immediately had the peace of God in your life. Amen? And so what they're struggling with here is that he, he says, I, I know you're fearful, you're troubled, because you, you don't sense my presence here, but it's me. And when you sense my presence, you have the peace. The second thing is the biblical evidence. And we began, he began not only as he, he told, it's me, guys, it's I'm here, I, I'm alive, but also he begins to show his purpose and the promise of Jesus. Let me show you that. Throw that up there, Joe. And then he said this. And these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Y'all understand that, that you can read scripture after scripture, but you must understand now that we have the Holy Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit who teaches us the Word of God. Amen? So, so I can give you all the Word of God here, and you can go home, and you say, well, wasn't that just a nice little sermon, or whatever you might say? You have to understand, to really get that into your soul, into, into something, that rhema, if you would, you need the Holy Spirit to speak that into you. So, so that's why Paul said to Christians, to the churches all the time, said, man, would y'all grow up? Quit just drinking milk and get some spiritual nutrients and get the meat of God and dig into that. And the only way you're going to get that is through the presence and the teaching of the Holy Spirit of God. Understand that, right? Not a degree, but the presence and teaching of the Spirit of God. And then he opened their minds to understand Scripture, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance of forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nation beginning in Jerusalem. Notice what he said. He said, and you are what? Well, you're witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you and saying that sitting to your clothed with power on high. And what is he talking about? He's talking about Acts chapter 2 where we see the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Holy Spirit. There. You know what caught my mind on this? And that Jesus isn't saying, I've got a new teaching for y'all. He didn't do that. And so often, I, you know, if you ever flip channels, I, I must confess to you, I watched just about 10 minutes this morning of a televangelist. And, and just about 10 minutes, and, and whatever. Anyway, um, and I watched it and I go, you know, there's got to be more. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, anything here, but I'm just saying there's got to be more. And I listened to that, and I thought... We need Jesus, and he needs to be the focus of everything that is taught, right? And when he's doing this, he says, I'm going to teach you these things, and I'm going to empower you these things. And it's not going to be a new teaching. It's me. Isn't that what Jesus said? And you know the scripture for John chapter 1. In the beginning was the, and the word was, and the word, and then verse 14, and the word became, and what? And that's what he's saying right here. 
He said, remember what I told you? It's, it's my word. It's a fulfillment of everything. It is me in the word, and the fulfillment of all scripture is found in me. And he gives us biblical evidence of who he is. He says, first of all, he says, here's the physical evidence. Look, look, it's me. Look, look at the hose here. Look, it's me. And then he says, and here's the prophetic word. He opens his mind, the minds up to those that are just searching. What did, what did he say about this? And did he lie to us? And all the confusion, but he says, it's me. I am the word of God. I am the word. I am the word. I am the word. Changed hearts and minds always reflect the word of God. Finally, then we see the personal evidence. Look at the very last of this thing. There's got to be a change here. What's, what's the last Joe? Personal evidence. Yeah, there you go. Keep going. Transform lives from invisibility to invincibility. What changed their lives? And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he, par he parted from them and was carried into the heavens. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple, blessing God. From distraught, disappointed, dejected disciples, now they're transformed. What happened to them? From locked doors to now they're publicly worshiping. Look what it said, that they're publicly worshiping these temples. From being isolated, from trying to be just invisible to changing the world by their lives. It's, it's amazing transform. They saw Jesus. I, I, I think what, what I see here more than anything else is that they finally came to realize of their destiny. And by that I just simply mean that they realized that, that all this time Jesus had been preparing them for this moment of his departure. And the fulfillment of Scripture and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, uh, of the Scripture, of, of the Spirit, would lead them to a place of fulfillment, but also of purpose and power that they were able to leave that locked door and to go into the streets and proclaim, even at the point of their own death. Can we say that about us? Romans. Here's a Scripture verse for us today, and this is it. If the spirit of him, of whose him? Jesus. If that same spirit of Jesus, the resurrected spirit of God, if that same spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in who? You and me. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Amen? The resurrected Jesus living in us. That's what it's about, folks. And so, so rather than, you know, looking at our lives and being focused on all this, when we see Jesus, I want you to know that our hearts are changed. I know we're going to have disappointment, but from disappointment, we come in to the realization that he burns deep within us and we must release it. But also we see when we see Jesus, we see these opportunities all around us. And this is my prayer for you this week. And for me, that in life and in going from, from whatever you do, that these opportunities will arise itself. And we would have spiritual eyes to see these opportunities and seize these with the power and the Spirit of God living within us, that we'll be able to be faithful like the disciples were. Rejected, disappointed, to faithful servant, even unto death. And all the disciples, save one, had a horrendous death experience. Would we be willing to do that? And so the prayer would be, Lord, would you present opportunities? And though they may look locked, and, and they may be in opposition, and they may be uh, uh, locked doors of disappointment in our life, Lord, would you lead us to those locked doors that we've said are off out of bounds for us? It may be a loved one. It may be a, a son or a daughter in your life. That you just said, man, there's no way we can go there anymore. That, I've, I, that child just, just doesn't like me anymore or whatever. Or it may be a relative. It may be a neighbor. It may be some past sins in your heart that you just have locked away and put a, a, a no entrance sign on that. And ask the Lord, Lord, I know you're already behind locked doors. 
Help me be obedient with the boldness. Now help me, rather than being invisible and trying evasive with this, but because all things are possible through Christ who lives in me, invincible. I can do all things through Christ who what? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, for your grace and your mercy. We are humbled. When we see these, this story, these two men just on a road of disappointment, rejection, and just a, trying to recover some sort of lostness, we're amazed that you reach out to them just as you've done with each of us in this room. You found us. Lord, forgive us when we've allowed disappointment to rule our walk with you, our journey with you. Help us today to realize that we have seen you. We have you in our hearts and our lives. Help us to turn our eyes toward you. Help us to see who you really are. And so that our hearts will be aflame and opportunities will always be a possibility. And that the power and the presence of the resurrected living Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God moves us to boldness and a witness to others and the testimony who Jesus really is. Help us to be your witnesses in all our lives. So Father, we, as we turn our lives over to you in our hearts, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Just with our heads are bowed and eyes closed, I, I, I think you know this. I'm going to play this song and let's sing this together. Just turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's make this just our prayer. Words are turn your eyes upon Jesus.